In this section, we'll learn how to test distributions using the exact binomial, t-test, and correlation, and how to create custom functions to calculate power for these tests. Let's start with the exact binomial test. You can test a binomial distribution against a specific probability using um, binome.test. So here we set x as the number of successes. Um, so say you've flipped a coin 10 times, how many times did it come up heads? So let's say 5 times. n is the number of trials, so we flip the coin 10 times. And p is the hypothesized probability of success. So what do we think our null effect is? If the coin were fair, we'd expect 50% of the flips to come up heads. So our um, hypothesized probability here is 0.5. We run the binome test. Now we can test simulated values from, say, a biased coin. Let's create a biased coin using our binome, the function that we learned about earlier. We're going to sample a single coin flip. Um, we'll sample it 10 times. Let's just set n to 10 up here. And it's a biased coin, so it's going to come up heads 60% of the time. So if we set n, our biased coin um, has come up heads 7 times in these 10 throws. So we'll set x here to biased coin n here to the value n, so we don't need to type it twice. We can only set it once and then use the variable. And we're testing it against the probability, the null probability of 0.5. So this test tells us whether or not the number of um, heads that we got is consistent or inconsistent with um, a fair. If we have seven successes, the p-value is 0.34 and 6, etc. So we can run this multiple times and note the p-values for different numbers. But if we want to estimate um, the rate for a specific kind of experiment, we need to repeat the sampling above many times. And a function is ideal for repeating something that's very similar over and over again. You set the arguments to the function to things that you might want to change. So let's call our function sim binome test. And the things that you might want to change in this function are different sample sizes. So we'll set that to n. Different effects, we'll call that bias. And different hypothesized probabilities. Now, um, when we're talking about the binomial distribution, 0 0.5 is often the probability that you want to test against, a 50-50 chance. So we'll give that a default value of 0.5. So, in our function, we're going to simulate a coin. So use our binome, simulate one coin flip n times. We'll take the n that's set in the function definition. And it will have this specific bias. Then we run a binomial test. Let's call it b-test, the output of that. So binome.test. We'll test the value of coin. Remember, it was um, flipped n times. And we're testing it against the probability p, this null probability. And we want to return the p-value. So we don't want this entire output here every time we run this function. Right now, we're just interested in the p-value. So we can set b test dollar sign p dot value to return that. So if we run that to set the function, let's test it once and see what kind of values we get. So if there's 10 coin flips and the bias is 0.6, and we won't set the p probability, we'll just leave that as the default. And we're getting these same numbers that we got before. 
now that you have this function, you can use it to calculate power for any design. You can set my reps as a variable and use the replicate function that we learned about in the last chapter to replicate this a number of times. We'll do it a thousand times and we'll run sim binome test, say with 100 coin flips instead and the bias of 0.6. So if we flipped a coin 100 times and it was actually a biased coin, um, this gives us all the p-values that we would get for each of those 100 flips, repeating it 1,000 times. Okay, so my reps is going to be um, actually 10,000 numbers, so we're not going to print them out. We can set our alpha value, our critical p-value. What's the probability of a false positive that we want to accept? Um, by default, people tend to use 0 0.05, but there's reasons that you might want to choose a different alpha value. And then we just calculate the mean of how many times my reps is less than the alpha value. So we're just counting up the proportion of these numbers that are less than that number. And that's our power. So 46% of these 10,000 replications, we are going to get um, a p-value that's smaller than our critical alpha if we actually have a coin that's biased in this way and we run 100 coin flips. Now the power tends to go up if you increase the number of coin flips, so let's double it to 200 coin flips in each experiment. And now our power is um, 78%. Now you can plot a distribution of the p-values. I'm just going to copy in this ggplot right now. Um, but it's a plain ggplot with a histogram. Um, we're going to plot my reps with a bin width of 0 0.05, so everything in the first bin is um, less than our critical alpha. And this shows us the distribution of p-values that we could expect in um, an experiment like this. Next, we'll look at the t-test. So you can use the t-test to compare the mean of one distribution to a null hypothesis, so a one sample t-test. We can compare the means of two samples with an independent samples t-test, or pairs of values in a paired samples t-test. Right? You can run a one sample t-test comparing the mean of your data um, to mu. So let's make a simulated distribution, sim norm, um, using the rnorm function. Let's draw 100 samples from a population with a mean of 0.5 and standard deviation of 1. So here are our 100 SimNorm values. And then we can use a t-test. We can compare these values and that distribution against um, a distribution that has a mean of 0 to see is this is the mean of this distribution different? Now the t-test function defaults to this one sample t-test um, if you only include one value. It tells you that the t-value is 3.6, degrees of freedom is 99, remember we simulated 100 values, and the p-value is quite small. So less than our critical alpha, we'll call this value significant. Now we, we run the simulation a few times, we'll get different values. But generally the same conclusion. You can run an independent samples t-test by comparing two vectors of values. Let's simulate a variable called a with our norm, and this will be 100 values from a distribution with a mean of 0.5 and a standard deviation of 1 and b, which will be the same thing, but the mean will be 0.2 higher, so 
So we set up our t-test with the same t-test function, but this time we put a and b in as the first two arguments, and we tell it that paired equals false. Now by default, paired is set to false, but it's really easy to become confused when you have a two samples in a t-test, whether you meant that to be a paired t-test or an independent samples, so I'd suggest always using paired equals false. Okay. This gives you a Welch two-sample t-test. Um, we have our t-value here and p-value. We can run this again a few times and see at this sample size, it's not very often a significant difference between 0.5 and 0.7. Now, how would we set up a sampling function for the t-test? Um, so when you run t.test, you see this display, but that's actually um, the display that's given when you print the t-test kind of list. If we set this to a variable, so t end for t independent, we can click on this and see that it's actually just a named list. There's things like the statistic, the parameter, p-value, confidence interval values, the estimates for our variables. So we can take t end, and if we want to just take the p-value from it for power calculation, we can do this. Um, you can figure out what the names are by clicking on it here in the environment or using the names function. And that will give you the names of all the values in that list. So let's create a function. We'll call it sim t end. So an independent samples t test. And again, when we set up a function, we want to give it arguments of things that we might want to change. So we probably will want to be changing the n, the mean of the first variable, and the standard deviation of the first variable, the mean of the second variable, and its standard deviation. We can give these default values, but we'll skip that for now. So the first thing we want to do in our function is simulate the first variable. We'll call it v1. And we just use our norm again. And we simulate n values from the function arguments with a mean of m1 from the arguments and standard deviation of sd1. We can do the same thing for variable 2. We give it mean 2 and sd2. Now we want to just copy this bit make a variable called tind, and that's the t-test of v1 versus v2 and paired samples. And we want to return tind p.value. So the simulation function takes these parameters, simulates some data, runs the t-test, gives you the p-value. Let's test it. Um, on one set of variables just to see if it gives you the expected values. So 100 samples again, um, 0.7 and 1 for the first mean and standard deviation, 0.5 and 1 for the second mean and standard deviation. And these look like pretty similar values to what we got before. So now we can use this to calculate power. We'll use the exact same code, really, as before. So we'll scroll up here. And we'll set my reps to 10,000 replications of this function instead. We'll use the same alpha. All right. And our power is pretty low, 29%. Now in base R, there's a function called power.t.test that you can analytically calculate power. So I bet you're wondering why are we doing all of this? Um, 
I'm starting with simple examples showing you how you simulate data, run a custom analysis, get the p-value from that analysis to calculate power. Um, if you're doing just a regular t-test, you can just use the power.t.test function. Um, but this shows you the, the basics of how you would do this for more complicated functions where there doesn't exist any analytic power calculation. But we can double check our calculations with power.t.test. So we can set here n equals 100. Um, delta, which is the difference between our two means in units of standard deviation, and we've got our standard deviation of 1, so it's just really the difference between these two here. So delta is 0.2. This is like the Cohen's d. Standard deviation of each of them is 1. Um, the power.t.test function doesn't let you give these different standard deviations, so your um, simulation function is already superior here. Um, we set the alpha, which they call sig level, to alpha. And we don't know the power. Um, and we need to tell it what type. So type equals two dot sample. So we have an independent samples or a two sample t-test. When we run that, you get this output. Our power here is 0.29, almost exactly what we calculated um, with our simulation. And just like before, we can plot our distribution of p-values. We'll just copy the same code. Since we called it my reps again, and this is the distribution of p-values for this particular test. A quick note, we set this boundary to zero in histogram when we're plotting p-values. If you don't do that, I'll comment this line out. It might be difficult to see here, but um, this is a smaller number than it was before. Um, because the boundary actually incorporates values a little bit to the left of zero, which are impossible. P-values can't be smaller than zero. So if you set boundary to zero, it makes sure that each of these bins starts at zero and doesn't start um, half the bin width before zero. All right. Finally, let's work out how do we um, calculate the correlation between two normally distributed variables and how do we calculate power for that? So you can test if continuous variables are related to each other using the core function or the core.test function. So actually, let's start with um, using our norm multi to make a quick table of correlated values. So we'll set the n here to 100 values. There's with two variables. Um, they'll both have a mean of 0, a standard deviation of 1, that's the default here, and r of negative 0 0.5, so they'll be negatively correlated with each other. Um, set the var names to x and y here. Okay. So here's our data table, and we can use the core function to co calculate the correlation um, for the entire table, and it'll give us a correlation matrix. Or we can look at the correlation specifically just between x and y. We don't care about the correlation between x and x or y and y. That will give you just the correlation. Or you can use core.test, and that gives you the same correlation, but also the t value and degrees of freedom for a significance test and the p value. Um, now, if you'd like to use Spearman's correlation, core and core test default to Pearson correlation, you can use the method argument and set that to Spearman to do a Spearman correlation. And this is the Spearman's rank correlation. So just like before, we need to create a sampling function. We'll call this one sim underscore core underscore test. 
And the things that we want to vary here are the n, like always, and the r. Let's give that a default of 0. So we just want to create n variables with a correlation of r. You can use that code right there. Um, set this to n instead of 100, and set this to r instead of negative 0.5. And then we can use core test. Let's use the Pearson's correlation since we're simulating normally distributed variables. And we can just put dollar sign p dot value after this if we want to only return the p value. So run that. And like always, we test it a few times and check that it gives us sensible values. So for 100 values with negative 0 0.5 correlation, we're getting very small p-values. If we give it a correlation of 0, we should get uniformly distributed p-values. Every possible p-value between 0 and 1 is equally likely. All right, so now to calculate power, we'll replicate this um, a thousand times. We'll go back up and just grab the same code again. And do sim core test. Let's set the correlation to negative 0.5 again. We can compare this to um, The value that we get from the power package, so there isn't um, a power calculation for R in base R, but if we use power pwr.r.test and set n equals 100 um, and r equals negative 0 0.5, and run that and see, yes, that is, it's very high, 0.999. Let's try setting them both to an n of 20. So our power should decrease if we have smaller numbers. 0.63. And we see, yes, that's correct. We get this from our analytic um, version as well as the simulation version. So this is just the very basics of how you would start creating your own custom functions, simulating data, and running a custom analysis on them and then returning the values that you care about. That might not necessarily be a p-value. Um, you can return effect sizes, you can return confidence intervals, or any other value that you can calculate in your analysis. And then replicate that function. Run it repeatedly and see what happens if you were to run it a thousand times and look at the distribution of these critical values that you would get given the parameters that you use to set up your simulation.